I was born in Lexington. I lived here my entire life. And the uh, only time I left home really was when I was 17, when I left for the military. And uh, you know, I joined as a minor. Had to have my parents sign a waiver for me to even enter the service. And uh, 17, I left Lexington and went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. But yeah, I lived here my whole life and big blue fan and went to Lafayette High School. And I played golf there. Could have played golf for college if I chose to, but I decided to enter the military, and that's what I did. Well, I seen them at Lafayette. They had they come in their class A's, and I was like, oh, that seems pretty cool. And I went and talked to them, and they showed me all the videos and talked about the money and what I could do and what I'd have waiting on me when I got out. And I was like, hmm, that sounds pretty good. So, you know, I took an ASVAB, which is similar to like a SAT. And the higher you score on your ASVAB, the more jobs you have available to you. So I wasn't going to join as infantry or something like that. I was only going to join if I had, you know, a good career option. So I, I took my test, scored very well on it, ended up uh, having the option to choose a job with a security clearance. And, you know, I looked into it and, you know, I had to be good with numbers. You had to be organized and have good, you know, people skills. And that's everything I had. So, you know, that and the main fact that I would have my entire education paid for after my service. That was the selling point once they told me that. And, you know, like I said, I went home and told my parents. And my dad was supportive. He's ex-military. He was in the Army as well. So he was all for it, especially after he found out the job that I was going to be having. And he came up there with me and signed the waiver. and. I went to the service. I left in October 2004, and you know I, was, I signed up probably about eight months earlier than that. I turned 18 in July, so I was technically 18 when I left for basic, but I signed up at 17. But you know you have to wait for the next the next basic training dates to open up. So I had eight months to prepare myself, and October 27th 2004 is when I joined and left Lexington for basic training. You know we get there and. It, I, I looked at it as a game. You know, it was fun to me. I didn't because the drill sergeants didn't know your name. You were doing, you're, you're doing right. If they knew your name, it was a problem. So I just did what I was told and stayed under the spotlight and did the best I could. And next thing I know, it I'm running past the older guys and I'm doing more push ups than the older guys. So it, it was really fun, but it was extremely cold. Um, well, wasn't too happy about that because just because the weather's bad, it doesn't mean you're going to take the day off. You know, you're still out there doing all that. But luckily for me, um, I got to come home for two weeks during my basic training. A lot of people don't get that opportunity because I was there during Christmas. So they let you come home for a two-week period. So I was there two months and got to come back to Lexington for two weeks. My job title was 15 Papa, Aviation Operations Specialist. Um, my job consisted, it was a very important job. Like I said earlier, I had to have a security clearance to, to even be considered for this job. And um, my job, I had to, um, well, when I was overseas, I had to track all the flights. That was I had to work in the TOC, which is the Tactical Operations Center. And this is where the security and clearance came to effect. Um, I was a specialist, and in this building were generals, colonels, captains, majors, you know, because I knew every detail of every mission. I knew where the aircraft were going. I knew what time they were leaving, what time they were arriving, the equipment they were carrying, the people they had on board. So, you know, your average Joe can't come in and know all this. It's a security threat. So um, that's why there's so many high-ranking people in there and why I had to have a security clearance. So... Um, I would be sitting at a desk. I would have my radios. I would have my GPS, which we call a Blue Force Tracker. And I would communicate back and forth with the aircraft. And I would relay information to them that the battle captain who was overseeing the talk at the time, he was a captain, um, he would tell me something. I would go on the radios with whichever aircraft and relay the information to them, whether it was bad weather coming in or security threats along the way. And um, we had a board. It's our flight tracking board, and I would have to log each departure time and each arrival time throughout their entire mission. So, you know, um, attention to detail is everything. And I would have to, if anybody came in, the sergeant major or the colonel, they would come ask me, you know, what's going on with these missions. And I would have to know every last bit of information to tell them. Very important job. They, they run a 
civilian background check on you for this type of security clearance, not just a military. So I could have all these awards and decorations, but if my civilian history had any glitches in it, I wouldn't qualify for this job at all to begin with. So, but, and that's how it is in the States too. And during the States, you know, we would just track um, like maintenance test flights, stuff like that. The pilots would come down, they have to log a certain amount of hours per week. And we would keep our flight record books up to date and we would sign out the aircraft keys and uh, be accountable for those, make sure they get signed in and signed out. We would sign out uh, night vision goggles. We were uh, responsible for the accountability of all the special equipment like that. So it was a very easy job in the States. It wasn't as stressful. We didn't have the colonels and the, you know, just be me and my sergeant down there just making sure that the pilots held up their end of the deal and signed in their keys and signed them out. And, and if they didn't, if they, we're running a late test flight coming back at 11. They were tired and went, went on to their car and went home without signing in their aircraft keys. We would have to get them on the phone and stay there until they drove back and signed them in. It's you know extremely important they got them in. That was our job to make sure that that happened. Where did you go first overseas? I went to Iraq. I was stationed in Tikrit. And um, actually, I was there for 13 months. And we worked, uh, it was 2005 to 2006, and we worked 12-hour shifts every day. 12 hours on, 12 hours off, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, without a day off. Um, we got to come home for two weeks while we were over there. Um, you get to put in for whatever two weeks you want off during the entire year, but that's the only two weeks you get to come home. And um, that's when I got my first experience of war. I mean, I was 18, and, um, you know, but in, a, in a way, I was excited to go. You know, me and all my, I had friends my age, so it's just kind of exciting to go over there. But, you know, once I touched my, once I put that first step on the ground, took a look around, I, I was kind of, kind of blown away. But we get there and we fly into Kuwait and um, the pilot comes over the airplane and, and says, you know, take a look out your window, we're landing in Kuwait International Airport and, and then you see all the lights and stuff and it's like a, your average city. But then, uh, you get off the plane and you, you, you see the people over there, for one. And that's the first thing you see. You know you're not home. And um, the air smells different. It smells dirty almost. It's not fresh like American air. And uh, Kuwait, we, we fly um, in a civilian aircraft from here to Kuwait. It's nice. It's like first class, the entire plane. You've got stewardess on there take care of it. You've got TVs in the back of your head rest and make it comfortable. But you know, you're holding your weapon, you're ready to go. And, um, when we get to Kuwait, that's when we hop onto the military aircrafts, you know, whether it's a Black Hawk or a 757, it, whatever you're designated to fly on is what you'll go. And that's when you fly or so, some people actually convoy into Iraq. So I flew, however, I flew in a Black Hawk helicopter. You stay in a tent with about 12 guys on a cot and um, sand on the floor. There's no hardwood or anything. And um, you go grab you a warm bottle of water that's been sitting in the heat all day. <laughs> and uh, you just wait until the next morning. You have a briefing, you know, about what time you're heading out and whatever. And when you get to Kuwait is when you get your ammo. You don't fly over with ammo on the airplane. They, uh, you get all your rounds and you get ready to rock and roll the next day. All right, we stayed in um, what we called shoes, combat housing units. It was like a little trailer, uh, had three people in it. It's probably, I don't know, 20 feet long, maybe 15 feet wide. It, I mean, it was, it was two cots on the end, one cot in the middle, and everybody had their own wall locker, and that was it. You, I mean, I could probably, me and my friend, or whoever I was staying with, we could both stretch our arms out and wouldn't have enough room to, to uh, stretch them out completely. Luckily for me, like the war um, started a few years before I went overseas, so the bases were much more built up. Like units prior to me, you know, I heard they had to like ba basically establish their own bases. They had to take over buildings and sleep in the streets and stuff like that. So I didn't have the experience that they had already built up bases when I went over. So... It's a little bit more fortunate than other guys, but yeah, they built that. They built uh, sand bunkers. They had probably, I don't know, 15, 20 foot um, concrete barriers that surrounded the top where I worked at. 
And um, it's probably about a mile walk. I'd walk out of my chew. I mean, the, the chews were in rows, probably 10 per row, 20 rows deep. So they, it was all in the same area. And um, it was about a mile walk to where I worked at, maybe a little under. And um, I would walk into my building, have my badge on, and uh, I'd walk in. And to the right would be my, my section, the radios. And then in the center was like a podium that was seated a little bit higher than everybody else. And that's where the battle captain sat at. And, you know, to the left of me, like it was a, uh, it was like a, I don't know, half a square shape. It was, uh, I was in the center and then on the two other walls, there was the weather. And then on the other wall was the security S2. And they would both relay to me, Hey, this, we just got word of a threat along this route and get a hold of the aircraft. And the weather would be like, we got bad weather coming in for this mission, get a hold of that aircraft. And then the battle captain's right behind me. Did you come under fire at uh, Decrit? Yes, sir. all the time. You know, my the fire I came under was mortar fire. That's how they liked to fight. They would shoot mortars from a distance, and um, they would try to get lucky. And you know, you could be doing anything. I could be sitting there watching a movie on my laptop in my room when I was off, or I could be walking to the chow hall, or I could be working. And what we found out was that if you heard, you know, the like that's a good thing because it's over your head, so you don't worry about that one. But when you don't hear it, you know it's re relatively close. But the thing about that is, it's the military. They try to space their bases out as best as they can. It's like throwing a needle in a haystack. Like with, well, can we use that phrase? But the odds of them hitting somebody walking is so small. You know, you have really nothing to worry about. I mean, yeah, they're firing mortars and they have to hit somewhere. And you know, unfortunately. They did hit a few places where, where people were at. and um, But the base is so spread out that you just you really don't pay it any mind, as weird as that may seem. Like, I could be watching a movie, and, me, and we would hear it, and me and my roommates would just look at each other and put our headphones back in and continue watching it, just hoping that, you know, I'm not going to be one of the unlucky ones. Mm -hmm. But if you're out, usually we're just too tired to get up. And... We would stay in our room, but if we were at work or if we were out at the gym or at the chow hall, they would, you know, the sirens would go off, and then that's when you would run and find cover under a bunker. Like I said, they had them all over the place. You always have one in a matter of steps, no matter where you were. You would just go hang there until the all clear came on. And um, but what was cool for me was that my job, you know, I worked in the talk, with, and I would always know what was going on. So we would always get some informants that would tell us where people like to fire these mortars at. So I would, or not me, the battle captain would get a mission together to go take care of these people. And I would track the whole thing and I would see it go down. So you now you always got to see payback on them, which is pretty cool. One of my biggest war stories is that I was a part of the mission that took care of Al Zakari. Um, I watched it happen. I watched the building explode. And, uh, we had gotten word that this was about to go down, and a hand few people got called into the talk, and they needed somebody to run the radio, so they called me. And um, I actually had gotten the day off. I think it was, I think it was June sixth that, uh, that 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 this mission happened, and uh, I had get I had been given the day off that day, and had been told to come in late that night, and I they wouldn't tell me why. You know, they didn't want me to tell anybody whatever and ask questions. I was like, okay. So I knew something was going down. I thought it was, you know, go find some other high-value target. But I didn't realize it would be as high as Al-Zakari. And um, I got there and got briefed on the mission. And we found out that a couple Air Force uh, jets were going to go drop a couple guided bombs there. And we got up our uh, um, our Predator feed. You familiar with the Predator? It's the... It's a, it's a plane that's flown from base. Like nobody's in it. It's like a remote control aircraft that can just hover a mile in the sky, and you can watch everything that's going down below you. The people down there, they don't have a clue what's up there. It makes zero noise. It's small. You can't see it, and you can see people clear as day. It's you know, it's a gray white feed. I'm sure you've seen it on the news. It's uh, it's pretty cool. We we launched our Predator, 
and um, we had um, the reason I needed to come up there is because we had our Apaches on standby in case you know something that, something went wrong or whatever. We just send them in there and take care of some things, but nothing went wrong, and we're all sitting there, a couple generals behind me, and we're watching this building, and next thing you know, it's not there anymore, wow. and nothing but smoke and dust take over the screen, and you know, that's when Al Zakario was killed, and that was Osama's number two, and uh, I saw that happen live, which is something I'll never forget. Been over there a year, and the unit that's replacing us finally gets there, and those poor guys, we're all cheering and smiles, and <laughs> they have a whole year ahead of them, what we just went through. But at that point, we didn't care. We just wanted to brief them, um, kind of give them an idea how we do things, because they're, you know, they're their own unit. They might do things differently, but we had a pretty good system. We trained them up, and got ready to go, and we... Uh, fly our military aircraft to Kuwait. In Kuwait, we hop on that civilian one, and people didn't take ambience that trip. We were just so excited and just all smiles. And we get uh, when we get over the States, the pilot comes over and says, you know, we're now over the United States, and the plane just erupts in cheers and all smiles. And we get to Fort Campbell and land, and we look outside, and there's hundreds of people with flags and our families. and we get off the plane to a standing ovation. Actually, we get to Atlanta first, and uh, the people, the somebody comes over the the airport in Atlanta. The entire Atlanta airport is huge, and they say, you know, we have some soldiers arriving from overseas. So as we're walking through the airport to our next terminal, we're just getting a standing ovation from everybody. It's like, it gives me chills thinking about it to this day. And then uh, we hop on our plane to go to Fort Campbell, and we get off and. We uh, file down the plane, and we get in formation, and we march into the hangar, and it's just like a football stadium the way it sounded. It was just our families in there and the news, and, you know, we get in there, and they tell us to halt, and y'all are dismissed, and we just run up and hug our families, and it's a good feeling. Right. Yeah. Right. And then I'm home for a year, and then I go back and do it all again in Afghanistan. After a deployment, you don't do much of anything. You know, you just busted your tail for 12-hour shifts for a year straight, came home only 14 days. They, You go do PT in the morning, and then usually at about 9 or 10, they're like, all right, you guys, go home for the day. Just because they know what we've done. They were there as well. So our NCOs, just, they don't really work as hard. You just show up for accountability purposes only, and, um, and you get to go home for the day. So the first three months is, is easy. And then after about that third month, you know, we're back – we're – back home and I would just go back to doing my job. But we knew we had a deployment to Afghanistan coming up. Um, so we were just getting ready to go to the range a few times a week, you know, start getting our equipment cleaned and accounted for and getting loaded and which was never fun. And then we uh, go up to um, Denver again and train up there and, um, that was it, just getting ready for Afghanistan. Just routine, nine to five job. So where were you going once you were in Afghanistan? Where did, where did, were you deployed? Uh, it was there? the same it was the same routine. Went to Kuwait and then from Kuwait I went to Kandahar this time, which was um um Osama's hometown. And uh I actually misspoke earlier. Al Zakari was uh Saddam's number two, I believe. And we were in his hometown in Tikrit, which was Saddam's, and then Afghanistan, Osama's hometown was where I was at, Kandahar. So that's why we received so much, so much fire right. in those two places. Okay. And um, we were going. I was in Kandahar, and this was. Uh, I didn't like this deployment at all. It was. I didn't like Iraq, but I could tolerate it, you know. But as soon as I stepped off the plane, in this one, it was cold. It was rainy. It was muddy. It was sandy. It wasn't gravel. Um, it was just miserable from the first step I took, and it was it stayed that way the entire deployment. Um, I I worked with the special forces um unit, really? which was pretty cool. Went it was uh, TK Terran Cout. Um, that was part of the medevac operations because they were special forces, and you know a lot of infantry come in and out of that base. So they sent two guys um to fly to Terran Cout, which is. People actually enjoyed it because you're um, you go up there with one other person. I went up there with one of my soldiers, 
I would work 12 hours. He would work, he would sleep and he would come work 12 hours and I would get off then. You didn't have all the other higher ups there with you. It was just you and him in this office by yourself. It was, uh, you know, we didn't have other NCOs there, other captains. There were no officers. It was kind of a, just a break from how busy it was back in Kandahar. So people actually enjoyed it. I actually paid somebody $200 one time for me to take their month. Because you went in month um, shit or at a time. So I would do one month and somebody would come lead me and do a month. So I actually paid somebody $200 once to do their month because of how much I enjoyed it there. Hmm. And um, But on the same note, it's, uh, it's kind of scary in a way because it's not really a it's a base, but it's a special forces one, so there are no lights. It's pitch black at night. And uh, one time, we were going on a mission, and the infantry had their night vision goggles on. And we were about to leave the base, and uh, they saw two um, green lasers pointing directly up in the sky, I don't know, about 100 yards apart, and it was on our base. So... They were curious what that was, so we turned off the aircraft, and they uh, we went to take a look at it, and they found that the lasers were at the chow hall, where hundreds of soldiers ate that every day. There was a laser on one side of the entrance, and there was a laser on the exit, both on the ground, hidden by rocks, pointing straight up, and that was to give you know somebody a target with the mortar to hit it. So they did a random search of all the the local nationals that served food there, and they found bomb making material in one of their rooms, and um, so they prevented what could have been, a, you know, disaster for the base I was at. Because, you know, you don't want anybody to have a. I mean, they shoot at our base and have to hit something as it is, but to have a target as visible as a laser, you know, they could lock in and they could have taken out four or five hundred soldiers at once if they hit it during the right hours. So it was pretty scary to see that they had that type of option to, to put lasers on our chow hall same what were called mods um it was like a like a dorm almost um you stay with four people and it's your standard size bedroom i guess in any household it was four cots in the corner and a wall locker a piece and we would always put like we'd always jerry rig it what we call we just put sheets like across the room in the shape of like a plus sign just to give us a little privacy mm -hmm. And um, but you would walk in this mod, and there'd be a hallway, and then there'd be eight rooms um, with a in each hallway. You know, they had with a door and everything, and there were just mods all across the place. But it wasn't like individual shoes. It was you had to walk into a building before you could walk into a room. So it was just the same thing, though. I remember mean, one time we got hit so close that the um, gravel it hit my window in my mod. And it knocked everything in my wall locker over. And that's a, the only time that I ever left my room when we were under fire and went to a bunker was when it hit that close. And then it turns out it was about 200 meters away where it hit. Hmm. And, um, yeah, it, pretty powerful. But other than that, we would just hear the sirens. The base was so big in, in Afghanistan, much bigger than Iraq. We had to actually drive to, like, the chow hall. We couldn't walk to it. It was so big. I received... Um, an Army Commendation Medal for both deployments, so two Army Commendation Medals and two Army Achievement Medals. And I uh, got promoted both times I was over there. It was a pretty smooth transition at first. And then, um, you know, I started struggling a little bit. Uh, you know, kind of being over at war for a year straight, and then um, dealing with everything you deal with and always being on guard and seeing the things you see. And then, you know, within 24 hours, you're back in the States. And it's a lot tougher transition than people would think. Because um, when you're overseas, you, there are no rules. You know, the U.S. military makes the rules. And um, you always got to be on guard and you never know what could happen. And um, like I said, the next day you wake up and you're back home with red lights and stop signs and crowds of people and then these people don't even know that yes or three days ago I was flying next to somebody that you know shrapnel all in their eyes bleeding profusely and and you know 72 hours later I'm walking in Fayette Mall you know it's it's tough and um, people don't unless you really experience you, you really won't understand and, um, but I was so busy transitioning 
out of the military when I got home, going, you know, turning all my equipment and stuff like that, that I didn't really have time to think about where I just was. It wasn't until I was out and I was home that, you know, I started realizing or recalling what I just witnessed and things I've seen. And, you know, I, I was just, I went, entered a phase of being real hostile towards people. A like real, uh, just aggravated. I would take things the wrong way. I'd always take things like people were out to get me. Like I would get like text messages and I would read them in like the complete wrong tone, just from being like always so demanding. And like when you're over there, you know, you gotta, you gotta be a force. Like when you're over there, you gotta be um, an authority figure when you're overseas. You know, the local nationals, they, they need to fear you and respect you. And you know, you need to tell them how it is and it's your way or no way. There's no compromising with those people. So now I'm back home and it's, you know, I carry that same attitude with me towards my friends and family and I don't realize it, but they do. And you know, after so many people telling you like, you know, what's, what's going on, what's wrong, why are you so hostile all the time? That's when I finally decided to go to the VA and start talking with somebody and trying to, trying to get help. And after talking with about, a, for about a year and a half, and the symptoms starting to get worse in a way. Not really the hostility, but the nightmares and the paranoia. That's when they diagnosed me with PTSD and um, started getting me in these stress and anxiety classes and coping classes and medication. And, you know, they're helping me get through it. Well, let me ask, uh, is there, there's no program uh, or process that the military has to help uh, personnel who have come back from a combat zone reintegrate themselves into civilian life? There is. There's mandatory classes that you have to go to that are over the period of a month. That's what you really do the first month is go to these classes. But for somebody like myself who is ETSing when they get back, you know, I was ready to just get out of the military and go home and see my family. So I was clearing. I was turning on my equipment because I was supposed to get out. While I was, a, I was a soldier that was stop loss. I was supposed to get out in um, September of or no, July or August of that year. I was supposed to get out, but my unit didn't get home until November. So, you know, I was supposed to get out months before I did. And um, since I was a stop loss, which means that. Well, I just said you're supposed to get out earlier than you do, but you can't because you're over in combat. As soon as I got off the plane, you know, within a few days, my NCO came up to me and was like, you know, start clearing, you know, let's get you out of here. And uh, I mean, I attended a couple of the classes, but I didn't do the whole full month. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of sad cases that happen. I mean, I've heard stories of you know soldiers beating their wives at, right after the deployment, and you know, punching holes in walls and you know, just losing it for no reason. Any little trigger could set them off. So, you know, I'm not, in these classes I go to, it's a room full of people. You know, it's a lot, it affects a lot more people than you would think. And, you know, I understand I'm not the only one going through this, so it makes me feel better. But on that same note, you know, I always feel like I'm, my symptoms are worse for some reason. And um, I just, I didn't do the classes when I came back from my deployment like everybody else did. I started clearing and getting out of the military. And now I'm doing those classes two and a half years later. Well, I started going back to school when I got back. And because of the GI Bill, they pay you to go to school. Like they, um, I got a check on first every month just to attend school. And then I started going to class and realizing that it wasn't until about my second semester that I realized that, like, we're halfway through the first one. My focus wasn't there. Um, I was always wandering off, starting having flashbacks of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just seeing people, hearing people talk sometimes irritated me. Like, that, they would complain about the simplest thing. And in my head, I'm thinking, you don't even understand, like, where I've been, what I've been through. And I always use that mentality. It's the wrong mentality to have, but I can't. It's something I'm working on. Like, I just don't like hearing people complain about too much homework or whatever when they just don't even know what, they don't even understand what tough life is really, really like and actual sacrificing and, 
you know, appreciating the little things like having showers and stuff like that. You take a lot for granted, I'll tell you that. And then you go overseas and you realize how much important little things are. And then I would just, I'd be paranoid. Like I, I always sat in the very back of class, very back. And um, I couldn't stand people sitting behind me. I um, really, I, I like it a lot. And yeah. Bluegrass Community and Technical College, we have more veterans than University of Kentucky does. That's interesting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's way more. Over 500 veterans attend BCTC. And um, only one other college in the state has more veterans than BCTC. And I want to, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I wish I knew. I think it was Western. Okay. But uh, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that. But um, the thing about BCTC is I like this, the smaller classrooms. Um, I can only imagine what would happen if I walked in the UK and sat in an auditorium sized room with 200 students in there and oh, yeah. 100 of them sitting behind me. I just I couldn't deal with that. Most of my goal is to be a CFO one day. And, um, okay. you know, if I can just get help with these other issues that I have going on, there's no doubt in my mind that I'll get there. And there's no doubt in my mind that I will get help and that I'll be able to function in society normally again. And um, it's not like I can't now. Like I, I can still go out if I choose to, but um, my preferred choice is at home, you know, with the door shut and the blind shut. That's my comfort zone. And it's sad. Like, I don't like to live like that. But unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, that's where I'm most comfortable at. And um, I've struggled in school the past couple of semesters um, dealing with it. And um, had it not been for the GI Bill, I might not have even attend it at all. I really don't use the BCTC uh, resources for these. I, the VA website has everything you need to know about how to cope with PTSD and everything because they have so many soldiers that deal with it. But um, not that the BCTC resources couldn't offer me that. They, sure, they most certainly could. But me personally, I've just solely dealt with the VA on this issue. We actually started the first student veteran organization at BCTC. and. Um, I was the treasurer, um, so I'm good with numbers, I was treasurer for the organization mm -hmm. and we started from the ground up. Um, it was me and a few other veterans and we actually uh, had a fundraising event um, one day and we brought more money than any other student organization has brought to BCTC, mm. which uh, I forget which employee told us that, but it was the one who allows organizations to set up booths and Oswald Building or whatever and we had a lot of people. We had a, the Army come up and set us up a simulation tank and had the Marines come up and they set up a pull-up bar, you know, for students to come do have pull-up contests and we had um, information to give out to students about military and the benefits of joining and I talked to dozens of students on why why they should join and or why not, whatever they, whatever the question they had, I would answer them. And, um, you know, unfortunately that organization doesn't exist as of now because the president and vice president had moved on and um, my boss, he no longer works there. So I'm not sure what, what the SVO, Student Veteran Organization, consists of now, but for the, during last semester and our time there, we, we actually got it running. We started, like I said, we started from the ground up. We wrote Congressman Chandler and tried to get a letter of support from him, which we weren't able to do. But that just shows you, you know, how serious we were about it. And um, you know, it was, it was kind of took pride in building it from the ground up. We really did because we started with four members: two pr a president, vice president, secretary, and a treasurer. And then by the end of the semester, we had 30 plus people attending our our meeting. So we felt pretty good about that. Uh, I just wish that like BCTC would be would take into factor somebody like myself who is suffering with PTSD and my grades have shown the last two semesters and um, you know not that I want a freebie by any means or that I deserve it over somebody else struggling with their own personal issues but I wish there was a way to maybe withdraw for some classes after the fact that it's already happened without having to do the whole appeals process. I wish there was somebody I could just talk to 
that deals with veterans and PTSD and showing my my uh, medical chart and the psych psychiatrist you know diagnosis and then that could just have them un have an understanding of why I made such poor grades the last semester or two and maybe turn those you know E's into I's or W's and, it's to, and get them off my transcript. If that's one thing I could change, I wish they would be more understanding of what, what, what we're going through as veterans that have seen the things we've seen and how it does affect us in the classroom.